people that I'm here. Because without me in your life, you're a nobody and a nothing because you're lame. And so you know what that priest would do? He would take the money and leave him just enough to survive for one more day so he could go back and bring him the next day. See, because a man that was crippled in that hour was considered of no value. See, here in America, we have handicapped parking. Here in America, we have ramps. We have crutches, walkers, electrical cars. We have wheelchairs. We have, we have things to make people with disabilities mobile. They didn't have that. So they had to carry. So the priest was willing to carry a man with an issue. But he wasn't willing to carry him into the presence of God to be healed. He was willing to carry him to find benefit from him, but he wasn't willing to carry him into the presence to let him find healing and restoration for his life. How many people do you know that won't take you all the way through? They'll just take you to a place. And so here is this man. He's sick. And all he knows how to do is pray. <coughs> You want to know what happens is one day, two men come walking by, Peter and John. My question to you is, where did Peter and John just come from? In Acts chapter 2, they had just come from praying in the upper room. They had just been tearing and waiting for a promise. They had just dwelled in the presence of God where a wind filled the room and fire fell upon them and they began to speak in tongues and they were endued with power. Now watch this. These two men come out of the temple. They come, let me say it right. These two men come out of the upper room and now they're on their way to church at the hour of prayer and they're coming to church. They don't just believe that God poured out. They believe that God filled them. And so when they come, they see this man begging and they begin to stop and begin to answer him. The man cries out some alms and Peter and John cry out and they say what? Look up at us. The man's thinking he's going to receive from their hand. But the first thing for your life to change is you have to learn how to look up and quit looking at your circumstances. Quit dwelling on your labors. Quit dwelling on your issues and begin to look up. Why is it important to look up? Because up speaks of the heavens. The word up, when you study it from its Hebrew meaning, it means to arouse. It means to awaken. It means to stir. I'm here to tell you today, the only way you're going to get out of your lameness is when you begin to look up. And when you look up, you're looking into the heavens. And these two men said, look up at us. Well, now that makes a relationship. God said, let us. Peter and John said, look up at us. What are they birthing in this man's life? Relationship. See, what happened is that priest was telling him he was relational, but he was not relational. He was conditional use only. What I can get from you. Now he's finding men of relationship. What are the two men's names? Peter and John. What does Peter's name mean? Petros. Which means what? Rock. A rock speaks of foundations. God laid the foundations with the apostles and the prophets. The foundation is called the capstone. Jesus is the capstone. So suddenly when this man began to look up, he began to find out that there are some apostolic foundations that he needed in his life. He found out that there is something he could build his life upon. You can build your life upon godly relationships. You can build your life upon people that are there for you. And Peter... And and John began to decree, look up. So this man was looking up at a place called Foundation. But it didn't stop there because the other man's name was John. John's name means beloved. So suddenly when you put these two names together, it means a foundation of love. What did this man have? This man didn't have love. He had abuse. This man was being rejected by a system. 
Can I say it like this? Here in America, we have an understanding of what the word rejection means. All over the world, everyone knows what the word reject means. The word rejection, according to our definition, is someone saying we're not good enough. And so they presently reject you. But you want to know what God says about the word rejection? Rejection says they weren't good enough for your future. So I took them out of your present. See, rejection is not someone telling you you're not good enough. Rejection defined by God is they're not good enough for your future. So I'm taking them out of your present. Though you might be experiencing some pain, in the end, you're going to be better off. And so here is this man looking up at the foundations of love. Peter and John said, silver and gold, we have none. But what we do have, what did they have? They had what filled them in the upper room. I'm here to tell you that when you know that you have God in your life, God isn't for you only. God is for your neighbor. God is for your friend. God is for the man that is sick. God is for the man that is in an issue. God in you is for someone in need. And they begin to realize what I'm filled with isn't for me. What I'm filled with is to give to others to make them free. And Peter and John said, silver and gold, we have none. But what we do have, we what? We give. Yes, come on. Relationship is give then take. Relationship is a take then give. You follow me? When you find true relationship, true relationship gives. It does it take? It's give then take. So now watch how simple this is. Peter and John says, "Silver and gold we do not have." But what we do have, we give to you. And what did they tell them? Rise up and walk. The man was lame. The man was weak in his what? Ankles. The Bible says he was weak in his ankle and bones. When you study the word bones out of the book of Ezekiel, <laughs> this valley is full of dry bones. You want to know what the word bones means there? It means, in Hebrew, substance. We can take that all the way back into the book of Hebrews. And you know what the Bible says about faith? Without faith, it's what? And faith is what? Substance. So suddenly, when we begin to look at the word bones, it means substance. Substance is what faith is made out of. So faith is likened to bones. This man had no faith because he had no substance of true relationship in his life. But when true relationship came in his life, this man found substance in relationship. When he found substance, he found faith. When he found faith, he had the power to get up. He can only get up because he had relationship. It's not good for man to be alone. So that's why God gave us helpmates. I'm here to tell you that we're here to help one another. Woe to the man who is alone. If he falls, he'll have no one there to help him up. I'm here to tell you that we need each other in the power of relationship because relationship will get us up. So Peter and John, what did they do? They ended the fundraising scheme in the priest. They broke the system of religion and they brought healing to a man that was living in firm. They dealt with a man who was lame in feet. He was begging and they knew that money was not the answer. So what did they give him? They gave him what they carried. And what did they carry? Power. What did they carry? Relationship. Wherever you want to see power, you got to find relationship. And suddenly, the power of relationship was released into this man. And immediately, where did he go? Where his heart wanted to be all along. He didn't run home to his family. Because he must have told them, the priest is robbing me. 
help me, and no one can. This man must have told people that I'm being taken advantage of, help me, and no one would. So the minute help came, he ran to where he knew the help came from. Where did the help come from? Say the house of the Lord. Immediately when this man's bones were made well, faith came in his life. Immediately he stood up walking, leaping, and praising God. And he ran into the temple and began to worship. I'm here to tell you, he was at a gate called beautiful that meant of the right hour, of the right season. But his hour and season could not manifest until true relationship reached out its hand. I'm here to tell you what's going to change your life is when you let true relationship pull you out of your lameness. Yes. Yes. When you let relationship pull you out of lameness, you know what it's going to do? It's going to cause you to dwell at a king's table. Let me get ready to take it back. Second Samuel. Second Samuel 4 4. With Shibble Seth wasn't born lame. He became lame because the religious system discarded him and saw no good. He was living his life out in a place called Lodabar without a pasture, with no communication. That means he was absent of relationship or friendship. But he didn't know that in 1 Samuel 18, long before he was even born, his daddy made a covenant with a friend. And his soul was knit to him. Though daddy was going to lose the kingdom. When he was knit to David, he was also knit to the kingdom. That word knit means to be looped together, to be forever looped. The word knit is a garment term. It means to knit things together. It means to build a garment. What does a garment do? It covers. So when Jonathan David's soul was knit together, they began to build a garment that was going to cover a man's iniquity and shame in the world. Do you realize right now that there is relationships that are formed to heal you of every problem in your life. God's birthing relationships. So here is this man by the name of Meshivosan. He's lame. Not born there. But circumstances caused him to be there. Lodomar, without a pastor. Without relationship. And now one day, David is dwelling in his kingdom and he's thinking upon his friend Jonathan. This means that the word and the covenant that David made never departed from his heart. He kept it ever present before him. And now as he's dwelling in his kingdom as a ruler, he begins to ponder of his friend Jonathan. The gift of God he begins to remember the covenant and the agreement he made. And he cries out and says, Is there not one of the house of Saul that I might show kindness to? Do you realize that when covenant is made, it will show kindness beyond your seed, but onto or beyond your generation to the next? And now what happens is this. He is told there's a man dwelling in a land of Lodabar. David saddles up and he goes. He falls prostrate before him. Meshibosheth falls prostrate before him. And he says, am I a dog? The king didn't even hear those words. What the king does is tells Shibble said, you're going to come dwell out my table. See, Meshibble said, you're a king's son because your dad made covenant with me. So what is mine is now yours. 
But if I just give you your land and your property, if I just give it to you, you're not going to be able to work it because you're lame. So I'm going to do something far greater. I'm going to send you that king's name. Can I have an usher just bring this right here? Can you put a chair behind it? Put a chair right here. I want you to begin to see what happens when you come to the king's table. This table is about the right height. The cloth is a little bit short, but it works. See, the king's cloth was white linen, and the white linen would drape to the floor. So you could not see what's under it. And so when Meshibosheth was brought, he was brought to the king's table. What was Meshibosheth's problem? He was lame in feet. But because he sat at the king's table, everyone thought him to be a king. And to be a king, you could not be lame. But no one knew that Meshibosheth was lame because his feet were covered under the See, do you realize that white speaks of his righteousness? Linen is to cover the iniquity of man. And so anything that was under this table was what? Covered. Do you realize that when you come and dine at the king's table, whatever your issue, whatever your infirmity, whatever your problem, whatever your drama is, it's covered. And when you begin to eat the lamb, the whole lamb, it's going to give you identity. When you begin to partake of the bread, it's going to give you resurrection power. When you drink of his wine, his cup of it, his blood, it speaks of there's a greater covenant called life for you. And so when he came to this table, you want to know what happened? No one knew he was infirmed. See, the king, when he came to this table... It was in the chamber of his bedroom. What did the king wear? He wore a kingly robe. But did he sleep in the robe? No. Did he wear the robe in his room? No. The robe was something he wore before the people. And so the king would have to take his robe off. And if the king was sitting at a dinner table, he didn't have to wear his robe. So he could be what? Naked. Naked means bare, without covering. And so the king could be without his kingly garment or uncovered. But when he came to this table, you know what he did? He would take it and he would place it. Here. Did you know that when you come into the king's table, it was unlawful for you to look him in the eyes. You could not look the king in the eyes. So if he's sitting at the table and you can't look at his eyes, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? If you can't look at his eyes and you look at the table, where does the table lead you? To his what? His heart. You know why you couldn't look at the king in the eyes? Because it was unlawful. But you had to look and know the heart of your king. And so, the heart of the king was to put Meshidosheth <coughs> under this garment. So one would know his nakedness. No one could ever see his infirmity. This morning, what God wants to do for you is he wants to cover you in his righteousness. He wants you to eat the spread off of his table, the kills. 
Lamb, bread, and meat is the meal that heals. You know what he wants to do? He wants to cover your shame. He wants to cover your issues. He wants to deliver you. But it can only be done through the power of relationship. Second Samuel chapter 19. I'm getting ready to conclude. <coughs> Second Samuel 19, verse 24. It says this. Now Meshibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had not cared for his feet, nor trimmed his mustache, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he returned in PC. David had just went to battle. It was a day of kings to go to war. And so when David went to war, Meshillosheb was supposed to go with him. Listen to what it says. So it was when he had came to Jerusalem to meet the king that the king said to him, Why did you not go with me, Meshillosheb? You're my son. You're supposed to ride with me. And he answered, My lord, O oh my king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said I will saddle a donkey, a donkey for myself, that I might ride and go on to the king. But your, but your servant is lame. Listen to verse 27. And he has slandered your servant, my Lord, to the king. But my Lord, the king, is like the angel of God. Therefore, do what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my Lord, the king. Yet you set your servant amongst those to eat at your own table. Therefore, what is right... Therefore, what right have I still to cry out any more to the king? So the king said to him, listen to these words. Why do you speak any more of your matters? I have said that you and Ziba are to divide the land. Then Meshavah said to the king, rather let him take it all in as much as my lord and the king has come back in peace to his house. There's two things going on. The first thing is, Meshavosheth is overcoming fear. Because the last time his king and his father went to battle, they never came back. He was too young then to ride with them. Now he's of age to go with King David. No one in his company knew he was lame, so they said, saddle your own donkey and ride with the king. Saddle your own horse and go ride with the king. You want to know why they said, saddle your own? It's because they did not know that Meshibosheth was lame. And so now Meshibosheth is looking at King David saying, I wanted to go with you, but I couldn't because no one saddled the donkey. No one helped me get on it. I couldn't ride with you. My heart was to go with you. So I've sat here since the day that you left in fear that if you didn't come back, I would be exposed and I would be no more. I know you said that I could have all the land and I could divide it with, with Mishpah, my, my daddy's servant, but I'd rather him take it all because I just want to dwell here continually at the table of the Lord where my life is healed, where my life is transformed. But listen to David's words when he says, why do you still dwell upon those matters? Did you see that in verse 27? <clears throat> Let me see. Maybe it's verse 28. He says this. For all my father's house were dead. Your servant is among those who eat. Therefore, what is right, I will still have. The king said, 29. 
Why do you speak any more of your what? Of your matters. What was the king telling him? You are only as lame as you think you are. You are only as crippled as you think you are. Don't you realize you were covered under the king's table? What's under the table is under the table. No one will ever know. Because it's hidden. The only thing Michelle said that keeps you crippled is you still think you are. Some of you in here today need to sit at the king's table. You know why? Because you still think of yourself as lame. God's come into your life. You sat at his table. But you still remember the man. Though you're covered, you're healed, you're delivered, you're set free. But maybe you just need to let him cover you in his righteousness. That no man can look you in the face and bring a charge against you. And now they have to see you at the heart where God 